as usual. Bring all of these concerns into our prayer time when we get there. And as usual, I will leave some time for silence. So if anything occurs to you that you would like to lift up at that point in time, uh, you may do so. Meanwhile, please join me in the prayer for illumination that is printed in the bulletin. Let us pray together. Gracious God, for generations, your word has brought love and life to your people. Speak to us now, we pray, that we may hear, and in hearing, we may be transformed. Amen. I don't have as many scripture readings. Uh, well, actually, that's not really true. I have quite a few scripture readings, but not as many as I had last week. Um, they, again, are going to be in the body of the sermon just for some cohesion. So we don't get, um, you know, a big scripture dump at the beginning and then try to remember everything I said. Um, we are in the fifth leg of our summer tour through the Bible. We are in uh, the prophets. Thus saith the Lord, say the prophets. Uh, we're going to learn just a little bit about each, uh, each of the prophets. That, well, we're going to learn a little bit about some of the prophets. Um, in, in, in the canon of the Bible. Uh, the, the, again, remember that fourfold journey on um, a, a spiritual journey, the invitation of God to come and to follow, uh, experience of roadblocks and struggle on that journey, the receiving of gifts and resources that God gives to continue the journey. And today we are looking at that fourth step in the journey where we come to recognize the community around us. That may be people who are in the car or in the bus with us who are also on this trip, or it may be a community that we have come to in our travels, or it may even be that we have returned home and we see it for the first time. So sometimes those roadblocks exist because God doesn't want us to go down a particular pathway and we have to bang our head against that barricade long enough to realize that and find a different path. And the wisdom that we receive from the books of wisdom, um, I, I should have thought of this last week, but I didn't. It's like the parable that Jesus tells of the builders. The wise person who follows God's instructions and God's precepts is like somebody who builds their house on rock. When the wind and the rain comes, the house, the house survives. A foolish person is somebody who disregards God's law and God's precepts and builds their house in sand. And eventually we know what happens with a house built on sand, it falls down. So today we're going to look at some of the books of the prophets. This is the fourth step in that journey, community. Before we get going, I need to let you know there are 17 books in the section of the prophets in the Old Testament. And we're going to deal with most of them today. I had given some thought to doing something with all of them, but then I got to thinking about a story that my mom told of one of her cousins and one of her uncles. They were all sitting around the table at dinner one night, and this particular cousin was old enough to be sitting up on his own, um, but not old enough really to be able to feed himself very well. And so my uncle Hank was feeding this child mashed potatoes. And as he was feeding this child mashed potatoes, he and his brothers got into a conversation and and he and he kept just he got excited about what was happening. I don't know if it was an argument or if it was just good gossip or what, but Uncle Hank kept shoveling the potatoes into little Johnny's mouth and kept it. And finally, somebody said, Hank, let him swallow. So I'm going to back off on giving you something on all 17 books of the prophets. I'm not going to shove mashed potatoes into your mouths. We're going to look at just a few of them which means some of these 17 prophets are just going to be brought into the room and given a seat of honor. And those prophets are Joel, Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Daniel, Hosea, Jonah, and the Book of Lamentations. Others, the rest of them, are going to carry the weight of interpretation. Those five are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, and Micah. Now, one thing that all 17 of those books of the prophets 
have in common are the themes of righteousness and justice. Because of that, I'm going to be basing a large section of my sermon this morning on the work of a man named Dennis Bratcher, who is a retired professor of Old Testament, um, who earned his PhD in biblical studies from Union Theological Seminary down there in Richmond, Virginia, and is an ordained minister in the Church of the Nazarene. I will be letting you know when I'm using his stuff because I will quote him. So let's get started. I have been also using this Bible in some of my work. Um, it's called the Learning Bible. It's the contemporary English version of the Bible. And I would recommend, if you can lift it, <laughs> um, to go to a secondhand bookstore someplace. And I got this in a secondhand bookstore. It was ridiculously inexpensive. Um, and 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 get this Bible. It is so good. Um, it's got introductions and outlines of each of the books of the Bible, uh, background articles and mini articles, charts, timelines, maps, reflection questions, memory verses, Bible reading plans in the back of the book, so you can just follow the plan for reading the Bible, and five categories of notes that show up. Oh, here's a one of the articles. And the, you have the text, and then on the side margins, you have notes. And those categories are geography, people and nations, objects, plants, and animals, history and culture, ideas and concepts, and cross-references. And they even quote some of the wisdom from the book of Proverbs. Do your best to learn from Proverbs 23, 12. So I highly recommend it if you can if, if you are interested and would like to get into the prophets that I am not bringing, but just, just having a seat in the room today, this would be a good one to do that. The Learning Bible, Contemporary English Version. It's also good for uh, exercising. <laughs> so I mentioned that because in this, there is a section on the role of the prophets. What did the prophets do? Well, who is a prophet? A prophet is a person called to speak for God and deliver God's message to the people. A lot of times we think of prophets as being somebody who can predict the future. They've got some kind of capacity to see in the future and know what's happening. We kind of consider Nostradamus to be somebody like that, except um, that's not what these prophets are doing. These prophets don't predict the future. Instead, they are so in tune to the current situation and circumstances of decisions being made by leaders that they can point to the inevitable outcome of those decisions. They can see what's coming. They can't see specifically, but they know because of a decision that somebody's made, they know it's going to happen. It's like telling your child, don't touch the hot stove. What's going to happen? You're going to find the back team somewhere. The prophets also address difficult political, social, or religious situations. And sometimes they spoke or acted in very colorful ways to attract attention to get their message across. For example, Jeremiah, when he began his ministry, put a wooden yoke on his neck as a way to demonstrate the power that a foreign king would have over the people if the current path of accommodation of the kings of Israel continued. Essentially, uh, they would be enslaved by another foreign king, in essence, returning to the lives of their ancestors in Egypt, except in their own land. Ezekiel was told by God to enact the siege of Jerusalem in his own body. If you look at chapter, <laughs> excuse me, Ezekiel chapter four, verses one through eight, you'll get the story of what God requested him to do. Uh, lying on his side, drawing a city, a, a representation of the city on a brick. It, it, it was unusual. Um, one of our Old Testament professors, J.J.R. Roberts said that Ezekiel was just a weird dude. So it, it's unusual, but it got people's attention. 
And Hosea, the prophet Hosea, used his own marriage to a prostitute to compare Israel's unfaithful relationship to God. Kind of extreme, but it was there and he used it. So the role of the prophet was to speak for God to the people, to do things in ways that caught people's attention and to say to the leaders, the people who had the power to make decisions, this is what's gonna happen because of that decision you made. You might be wishing really, really hard for a different outcome, but we know because we are God's people, and God has set this path of righteousness and justice before us, you, sir, have veered off of it, and you're gonna hit a barricade. Usually, the prophets would introduce their speeches to the people with the phrase, Ko amar Yahweh, thus saith the Lord, as the King James Version translates that. This showed that the prophets were not just giving their own opinion on a situation, but had considered themselves God's messenger, given the authority to speak for God. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 through 24 in the NRSV says this, thus says the Lord, do not let the wise boast in their wisdom. Do not let the mighty boast in their might. Do not let the wealthy boast in their wealth. But let those who boast, boast in this, that they understand and know me, that I am the Lord, I act with steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things, I delight, says the Lord. So you not only get Jeremiah beginning, thus saith the Lord, but he ends that with thus saith the Lord, and a book ended that. Some prophets spoke as early as 760 BCE, and others as late as 445 BCE. It was a span of about 315 years in Israel's history. And their messages emphasized different situations. Amos, Micah, Zephaniah, they said to the people and to the leaders, change how you were acting so as not to receive the punishment that the other nations have received at the hands of the current superpower crashing through the area. Don't make alliances with them. It's not going to save you. Jeremiah and Ezekiel warned about the coming defeat of Jerusalem and the exile to Babylon. Yo, kings, you've made these decisions. You've made these alliances. You've seen what's happened to our neighbors. This is where we're going. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi spoke to the people after they had returned from Babylon in order to give them words of hope and words of comfort and the assurance that God had not forgotten them. And the book of Isaiah spans all of those eras. So the book of Isaiah is Isaiah's ministry, Isaiah in exile, and then people writing in Isaiah's name after they had come home. The book of Daniel is a little unusual because it wasn't put together in its current form until about 165 BCE, long after Daniel was dead. And a lot of the imagery and a lot of the visions that are in the book of Daniel show up in the book of Revelation, which we'll get to in a few weeks. So the message of the prophets from around 760 BCE all the way to about 165 BCE, a span of about 600 years, is consistent. It's continual and it is relevant to God's people at any time in history. It talks about their relationship to God and their relationship to one another based on that relationship with God. All right, now I'm going to get to Dennis Bratcher. Um, this is from a lecture that he gave in 1998 in uh, Korea. He said, the prophets were not as concerned with pointing to the great acts of God in the past as they were in using those acts of God as a basis for calling people to responsibility in the present. They did that by painting, oh, I'm sorry, 
too far away. I couldn't read what I wrote. They did that by pairing uh, the concepts of righteousness and justice. For the prophets, the concept of I will be your God is righteousness. And the response, we are your people, is expressed in justice. So let's look a little bit about what those two things are. Righteousness is what the people were to be and to do because of God and in relationship to God. God had brought them out of Egypt into the wilderness, remained with them in the wilderness, brought them home, was with them while they became a nation, was with the kings if they listened. God was the, was the source of salvation, and God was to be the object of their worship. That's righteousness. Righteousness is to be in a right relationship with God, understanding that it is only God who saves. It is only God who provides. It is only God who should be worshiped. We act accordingly. We act in the world according to that understanding of righteousness. So that's righteousness. It's all vertical. God pouring uh, its resources and love and acceptance into us. We respond to that. Which is why every Sunday I do the love of the God who created you like this. Um, anyway, the other theme, the other idea is justice. Justice is how the people were to live in the world in relationship to each other and to other people. They were to practice justice towards others. Bratcher says this, justice in this sense does not carry the legal meaning sometimes attached to it. It's not making sure that everyone gets exactly what they deserve based on the law. Frequently when people say, we want justice, what they're really saying is we want vengeance. Yes, justice does involve people being judged by the law and justice is to practice grace and mercy towards those who have no power to secure it for themselves. It means to protect and defend those who are helpless and powerless. This comes straight out of the wisdom literature. Psalm 89 verse 14 from the New Living Translation says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. Unfailing love and truth walk before God as attendants. So the scripture, Old Testament scripture, the, the call of God, the, the, the struggle that people experience with God, the gifts given of God, Consistently running through them are the themes of righteousness and justice. And we have to wonder, why did the prophets emphasize these two traits of Yahweh? In order for the people to be led well. Isaiah 51, verse 7, from the New Living Translation, has Isaiah saying, God speaking through Isaiah and saying this. Listen to me. You who know right from wrong, you who cherish my law in your hearts, do not be afraid of people's scorn. Do not fear their insults. So as though the prophet, the Lord is speaking through the prophet and saying, I know, I know what I ask of you is not easy. It's so much less difficult to take the easy path, to go along to get along. I don't want that. And Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 3 in the New Living Translation, uh, we have, Ko amar This is what the Lord says, thus saith the Lord, be fair minded and just. Do what is right. Help those who have been robbed. Rescue them from their oppressors. Quit your evil deeds. Do not mistreat foreigners, orphans, and widows. Stop murdering the innocent. This is spoken directly to the leaders. Compassion and justice for the powerless is what defines a good king. 
a good leader, not how great the buildings, the army, or the treasury is. If you've got a booming economy on the backs of the working class, that's not just. And Ezekiel, and if that is something that is a reality, uh, you may hear God speak through a prophet these words. Uh, th there's something a little different about thus saith the Lord in Ezekiel chapter 6, verses 11 through 14. We have ko amar Adonai Yahweh. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Clap your hands in horror and stamp your feet. Cry out because of all the detestable sins the people of Israel have committed. Now they are going to die from war and famine and disease. Disease will strike down those who are far away in exile. War will destroy those who are nearby. And anyone who survives will be killed by famine. So at last, I will spend my fury on them. They will know that I am the Lord when their dead lie scattered among their idols and altars on every hill and mountain and under every green tree and every great shade tree, the places where they offered sacrifices to their idols. I will crush them and make their cities desolate from the wilderness in the south to Ribla in the north. They will know that I am the Lord. Ooh. Whoa, watch out. But it got some people's attention. Some people were re able to repent, but not the people that mattered. The leaders still made their unwise, unsound, accommodating political decisions, and the people were still taken away into exile. Bratcher goes on to say that grounded in the historical revelation of God in Israel's history, especially in the Exodus, the Israelites were to live out in the world being God's people in ways that reflected the kind of God whom they served. They had once been slaves and knew what it meant to be powerless and oppressed, and yet God delivered them from that oppression. That deliverance, that encounter with God must forever change how they lived in the world. And that idea of being altered by God's graciousness is reflected in Amos chapter 5, verse 24, from the New Revised Standard Version, let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And the prophet Micah in chapter 6, verse 8 from the New Revised Standard Version says, He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God? And when the people had returned from exile, the last part of the book of Isaiah offers words of comfort and encouragement and of hope for the future. This is Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4, and you might recognize the first couple of verses because they get repeated by a later prophet who we'll get to in a, in a few weeks. This is Isaiah 61, 1 through 4, reading from Eugene Peterson's Paraphrase the Message. The Spirit of God is on me because God has anointed me. He sent me to preach good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, announce freedom to all captives, pardon for all prisoners. God sent me to announce the year of his grace, a celebration of God's destruction of our enemies and to comfort all who mourn. This is specifically to the people who have returned. To care for the needs of all who mourn in Zion. To give them bouquets of roses instead of ashes. Messages of joy instead of news of doom. A praising heart instead of a languid spirit. Rename them oaks of righteousness planted by God to display his glory. They'll rebuild the old ruins. Raise a new city out of the wreckage. 
They'll start over on the ruined cities. Take the rubble left behind and make it new. Righteousness and justice are part of our God. And those words continually spoken over and over to the leaders and the people who were running off the road again, being distracted by sideshow side show exhibits. Ooh, let's go see the world's biggest groundhog or prairie dog. That's what it was. We were going to try to see the world's biggest prairie dog one time. And my family didn't want me to do it because I was driving into a tornado. <laughs> anyway. What do we learn then from these, the prophets? We learn that God's word has not and never will be silenced by the sinfulness of humanity. We learn that God's intention for righteousness and justice, God's own person is to be reflected in us and that intention continues even to this day. As I was thinking about the 17 books of prophecy, I got to thinking about prophets in our own time, people in our own history, people that we saw with our own eyes, or at least saw pictures of in newspapers and on television with our own eyes, people who also understood the idea of justice and righteousness and the way that we are to live in it. Nelson Mandela, the anti-apartheid activist, once said, overcoming poverty is not a task of charity, it is an act of justice. Martin Luther King Jr., civil rights leader, based all of his work on the justice and righteousness of God. Paul Elric, who was a biologist and an author and an ecological activist, was motivated by a sense of justice for creation. Dorothy Day was an anti-poverty activist, and she once said, love casts out fear, but we have to get over the fear in order to get close enough to love. Mahatma Gandhi based all of his resistance on nonviolence. Jane Addams, a suffragist and a women's rights leader. Ida B. Wells, a journalist and a civil rights leader. Ida Wells once said, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. And Cesar Chavez, who uh, was an activist for workers' rights, he said, you are never strong enough that you don't need help. And for him, the idea of moving into a future that was more just and more righteous came within a community of people. You in your own person may find yourself in the need to move into something new. You in your own individual journey are on that fourfold path of invitation, of struggle, of receiving gifts and of finding community. But we are all in that same journey together. And when we come to that fourth step, we find ourselves sharing what we have received in the third step, recounting the struggles we had in the second step, and reinvigorating and reinforcing the call that we all received in the first one when we gather in community, because that is where God wants us to be. And seriously, when we're on the other side of this mortal veil, what are we going to find? Well, we don't really know, but my hope is that we find perfect community. Full understanding and a warm embrace of acceptance. Rabbi Ab Abraham Heschel once said that the prophets always saying, what do you do, honey? <laughs> they were empowered by a vision of how things could be, a future in which the people and their leaders would live out their calling to be the people of God as a channel of blessing to the world. And the prophets had the courage to call into question any preoccupation with the status quo on any level that interfered with that future. The principles of the prophets still stand today, reaffirmed by Jesus in the New Testament. We still have to ask tough questions of how to live out being God's people today. And if we do not, 
we fail to fulfill the biblical principles of justice and righteousness to which the prophets and Jesus continue to call us. So how do we do that? By being thoroughly steeped in the love of God as we find it in scripture. One last word from a modern prophet. Bernice King once said, love is not a weak, spineless emotion. It is a powerful moral force on the side of justice. Thanks be to God for the gift we have been given in scripture, in the stories of people who heard God's call, who spoke with courage and boldness, righteousness and justice. Thanks be to the one who gives us all we need for the living of these days. Amen.